uh, final presentation in this year's uh, Earl Robinson Memorial Lecture Series. And it's a series that was established in memory of Colonel Earl Robinson, who was the first president of Booth University College. And one thing that I forgot to mention, Joel, last evening in mentioning Earl, was that Earl was an alumnus of Fuller Seminary, completed a D-Min program at Fuller uh, years ago now. My, it must have been in the late 1980s uh, that he completed that program. So there was a connection there. Our lecture this evening, as, I, as uh, Roy introduced so well last evening, is uh, Professor Joel Green from Fuller Seminary. And we're very, very pleased to have him. I'm not going to say any more because I want to give Joel as much time as possible and then afterwards for question and answers uh, and responses and comments. And uh, we will have some good time for that this evening. So without anything further, Professor Green. Thank you and good evening. I, uh, you may know, have not had internet access since I've been here. Uh, the hotel where I'm staying has had the internet down and several of you have tried to save me uh, and get me hooked up with uh, internet. It's actually been quite nice uh, not to have any email for two days. I struggle to imagine what it will be like tomorrow. I tell you this because my wife wanted me to show you a picture which I can't do because it apparently is sitting in my email box. It's uh, our backyard. She took a picture today so you could see it uh, with the orange tree, uh, with all of the oranges uh, ripening even as we speak, the palm tree swaying in the wind in the backyard. Uh, it really is there in passing that we can't imagine how cold it has been, uh, since, we've been since I've been here. But I've been keeping her up to date with the uh, frigid temperatures. It's been wonderful to be inside with all of you. Uh, the cold outside matched by the warmth inside, and I've appreciated so much the hospitality that you all have extended me over these two days. It's been a lovely time to have conversation and to look at uh, these important issues around what it means to be human and what it means to be human before God. This evening I want to focus on the question of conversion and the title then would be, Are You Converted? Uh, reading Luke, Reframing Assumptions. The question then I want to ask is simply this, have you converted? And I know before you can answer this question, uh, you have to know who's doing the asking and what they mean when they say converted. Some of you will have images of camp meeting evangelists urging you to come forward while we sing one more verse, just one more verse of the hymn. Others are wondering if we're talking about moving from a PC to a Mac, undergoing that kind of conversion. Here, though, I'm supposing that most of us are thinking of conversion as a religious term because, after all, we are at Booth tonight. Even so, conversion can mean different things to different ones of us, depending on our tradition. I noticed, for example, not long ago, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints lists 10 ways to know that you're converted. I especially like reading number nine. Let me read it to you. When converted, you look forward to paying your tithe. You view it as a privilege and feel that 10% is just not that much after all, especially compared with the blessings and satisfactions you gain. These blessings are worth much more than the money you paid. Well, so much for uh, the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints. One famous evangelist uh, that I ran into apparently thought you could be saved without being converted, while others wonder whether it isn't possible to be a Christian and be unconverted. And I myself, having grown up as I did in the American South, have seen many teenagers who seem to think they need repeatedly to be converted, and maybe they do. Of course, Episcopalians and Pres Presbyterians might understand the term in one way, where Salvationists or Baptists or Methodists might understand it in quite some other. And the term conversion has other uses as well. How many dog years converted into human years? 
or millimeters into inches or Armenian drams into dollars Canadian. So how we frame the question, conversion, makes a difference. I think about the many times I've accompanied my wife Pam to get a picture framed. We might have scored an antique portrait of the Durham Cathedral, for example, or landed a nice reproduction of Bruegel's Tower of Babel. Those would be for my office, not for our living room, and we need a frame. So we go to the framing store where I am drawn to such and such a frame, only to discover almost without fail that Pam has chosen another, and we typically go with hers. Each frame we choose, each frame we look at, would cause us to see the same picture in different ways. You know how this works. After all, a picture is many things, colors, textures, potentially multiple focal points, and different frames can draw out different aspects of the same painting. So the question is always, what features of the picture do we want to showcase with what frame? If we take a few steps back and move into a little more abstract thinking, those of us who are interested in how institutions think can frame institutions like universities or churches or even a dot-com, I suppose, by drawing attention to its organizational charts or drawing attention to the giftedness of its people or drawing attention to the way it distributes and uses power or drawing attention to the values that the institution attempts to inculcate in its people. Organizations are all of those things and more, but different people visualize them through different frames and therefore they see different things. Now in the field of linguistics, frame refers to the larger patterns within which we locate experience and make sense of terms, concepts, and experiences. Consider these words, number 41. Let me turn this on. That will help. Number 41. Hearing those words, what we make of them depends on, well, where we're standing. Are we standing in line for a bagel? Looking for a road that runs north and south through the American upper Midwest? Scouting a certain center on an NHL team? Or trying to distinguish between U.S. presidents named Bush? As Vivian Evans and Melanie Green put in their textbook on cognitive linguistics, frame refers to a schematization of experience, a knowledge structure represented at the conceptual level and held in long-term memory, end of quote. So we associate terms and experiences with whole patterns of thought and belief. As a result, like knocking over a single domino, thinking of a single object can set in motion an entire experience structure the question is, what experience structure do we have in mind when we refer to conversion? Historically, theologically, conversion is a crucial term for Christians. But what conversion means depends a great deal on how it is framed. This evening, then, I want to identify two ways of framing conversion one that has been with us for over a century and that for many of us is simply what conversion is. And then a second with an even more ancient pedigree. So I want to contrast a broadly held view of conversion today with conversion as this is framed in the Gospel of Luke and the back book of Acts, that is framed within Luke-Acts. What do people mean when they say, are you converted? What do people mean when they study conversion? The typical answer to my question reflects a particularly widespread definition of conversion, namely the resolution of a subjective inner crisis of an autonomous individual. Here, it isn't hard to find casting its long shadow on contemporary conversion talk, the work of William James from the early 20th century. James was something of a resonance man, renaissance man, there we are, 
He stood at the intersection of multiple disciplines, psychology, physiology, philosophy, and in his 1901-1902 Gifford lectures at Edinburgh University, he spoke and those lectures were published under the title, The Varieties of Religious Experience. James articulates his view that religious experience is primary of human nature, but gives rise to various theologies, philosophies, and religious institutions. Basic to, the all, to them all, he says, are the feelings, acts, and experiences of individuals in their solitude, so far as they apprehend themselves to stand in relation to whatever they may consider the divine. Given James's emphases on individuality and interiority, James' definition of conversion is as unsurprising as it may be broadly familiar to us. This is how he writes, to be converted, to be regenerated, to receive grace, to experience religion, to gain an assurance. These are, he says, so many phrases that denote the process, gradual or sudden, by which the self hitherto divided and consciously wrong, inferior and unhappy, becomes unified and consciously right, superior and happy, in consequence of its firmer hold upon religious realities. This, at least, is what conversion signifies in general terms, whether we believe that a direct divine operation is needed to bring such a moral change about. Now, James's parade example of conversion as self-surrender is Paul, whose conversion, he claims, represents those striking, quote, striking instantaneous instances in which often amid tremendous emotional excitement or perturbation of the senses, a complete division is established in the twinkling of an eye between the old life and the new. By old and new life, James refers to the inner self, that is, the movement from a place of self-estrangement to a place where, quote, the spiritual emotions are the habitual core of the personal energy. So for James, conversion follows a pattern grounded centrally in the experience of the sick soul, the divided self. And he describes this conversion in terms approaching the psychopathological, not the conception or intellectual perception of evil, he says, but the grisly, blood-freezing, heart-palsying sensation of it close upon oneself. From here, he is able to identify the real core of the religious problem with these two words, help, help. Conversion, then, is the resolution of an individual's inner subjective crisis. Now, James has articulated perspectives that are common today, at least in the West. These perspectives include his emphasis on individual experience rather than corporate life, and his notion that the real locus of religion is in experience and feeling and feeling-based, individual-oriented, interior religion. References to James don't pervade the study of Scripture. Instead, his work comes to us indirectly as though it were in the air we breathe as we read the Bible. For many, though, James's thought has been mediated into biblical studies by the British classicist A.D. Knott, whose study of conversion is a modern classic. Conversion, the old and new in religion from Alexander the Great to Augustine, or you might say Augustine of Hippo. Knott writes, by conversion... We mean the reorientation of the soul of an individual. That person's deliberate turning from indifferent or from an earlier form of piety to another. A turning that involves a consciousness that a great change is involved, that the old was wrong and the new is right. Explicitly referring to William James, Knock writes of, quote, a passion of willingness, an acquiescence, that removes the feeling of anxiety, a sense of perceiving truths not known before, a sense of clean and beautiful newness within and without, an ecstasy of happiness, end of quote. 
Hopefully, you're able to hear echoes of William James's interest in individuality and interiority with a pivotal role given to an individual's emotional turmoil in understanding conversion. Now, if we turn to the New Testament, the language of conversion actually congregates especially in the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, or Luke-Acts. So it's no surprise that in recent years, we've seen a handful of studies of conversion in the Lucan material. They've surfaced a number of questions. Let me give you a quick laundry list. Is conversion a cognitive category, a moral category, or both? Is conversion a crossing of religious boundaries, a rejection of one manner of life, embracing more fully the life one has chosen, or is it both? What's the relationship between conversion as a change of mind and behavioral transformation? Is conversion an event or a process? Is conversion a matter of human self-correction, or is it the consequence of divine initiative? These questions, even the way they're formulated, betray a pretty common and pervasive understanding of conversion. Namely, conversion is the resolution of a subjective inner crisis of an autonomous individual. You have, in fact, seen the same slide now three times. Again, it's hard not to hear in these questions the voice of William James, like a ventriloquist working his puppet, or at least his prodigious influence in Lucan studies. Well, of course, Luke hasn't read William James. <clears throat> he hasn't read the varieties of religious experience. Unsurprisingly, then, when Luke introduces conversion, when he theologizes about conversion, when he tells stories of conversion in the Gospel of Luke or the Book of Acts, he doesn't actually begin with James's categories. We hear nothing of a person in her solitude. We hear nothing of instantaneous instances. We hear nothing of sick souls or interiority or self-estrangement or of grisly, blood-freezing, heart-palsying sensations. What do we hear as we read Luke? Well, in fact, conversion is integral to the story that Luke wants to tell. This is clear already in the Gospel of Luke chapter 3, where Luke presents the story of John the Baptist, his context and mission, and provides a kind of programmatic text that allows us to determine, at least in a provisional way, four aspects of Luke's understanding of conversion, all of which then derive from Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. One, Conversion is not so much acquiescence to a particular set of faith claims as it is rather a participation in the unfolding of a particular story. It is, in a sense, reading oneself into the grand mural, the grand narrative, the grand story of God's agenda for Israel. Secondly, conversion is identified with an orientation around God's end-time purpose. This means that Conversion is deeply embedded in the ancient story of God's dealings with Israel so that it is to this God that life is directed. In fact, sometimes I'm tempted to translate the language of conversion in Luke as alignment or realignment with God's purpose. Thirdly, conversion is basic to Luke's presentation of God's restoration of God's people. Hence, even if conversion is personal, it is never individualistic. And then fourthly, conversion is inseparable from the practices constitutive of participation in the remnant comprising God's restored people. Conversion is both gracious gift and response. Luke's theology of conversion refuses any simple, simple distinction between conversion as an act and a process, between cognitive and moral change, between movement from one religion to another and deepening commitment within one's own religion and between personal and community formation. Conversion says yes for Luke to all of those things. Now you may say to me, Joel, it sounds to me like Luke is very much a Wesleyan. And he is. Or should I say, Wesley was a Lucan? 
Let's read further into Luke's account, though, to see how this both solidifies and extends some of the emphases that I'm trying to lay out. This evening, then, I want to use Luke's presentation of Peter, Peter's conversion, as an illustration. We begin, then, with Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, where Peter calls his first disciples. Uh, Jesus, rather, calls his first disciples. Luke begins with a wide-angle lens, but quickly centers on the interaction between Jesus and Simon. Simon's partners are named in verse 7, as James and John in verse 10, but Luke mentions no interaction between them and Jesus. Moreover, the commission, don't be afraid, from now on you'll be fishing for people, in verse 10, is addressed to Simon alone. So Simon demonstrates the appropriate response to Jesus' mission. Simon is representative of the others in another sense, and that is the way in which along with him appears his partners, and then the way Luke assures their communal response of James and John with Simon in verse 11, when we read, leaving everything, they followed him. His response then leads to theirs. Luke sets the stage for Simon's response in three ways. First, we gather that Simon, along with the crowds, is the recipient of God's word. This phrase is used in Acts for the good news concerning Jesus, but in Luke, it's used for Jesus' own words, his own proclamation. Given that Luke provides in verse 1 nothing by way of the substance of Jesus' preaching, we can do little else but assume that it is very much a part of what he has already said, uh, for example, in Luke chapter 4, regarding good news to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind, the message of God's kingdom. Second, Jesus presses Simon into service, both in using Simon's boat as a speaking platform and in his directive to Simon that he maneuver the boat into the deep water and drop his nets. Simon performs the first service without hesitation, the second only after a little skepticism. Together with Simon's report that the whole night of fishing had been unproductive, his skepticism highlights, third, the miraculous nature of the catch, so enormous that the nets began to tear. They filled both boats with the result that they threatened to sink. Word and deed thus prepare for the interaction between Simon and Jesus. Simon refers to Jesus first as master, a term that at best is neutral and possibly even negative in the Gospel of Luke, certainly lacking full identity of Jesus. But then he refers to Jesus as kurios, that is, as Lord, and confesses his unworthiness in relation to the Lord Jesus. In the face, then, of divine revelation, he can only respond with gestures of humility. He dropped to his knees. And his awareness of the con contrast between himself, a sinner, and Jesus, the Lord. Even if Peter's grasp of the significance of this title for Jesus is incomplete, his identification of Jesus as Lord both signifies a profound statement regarding Jesus' status and also points to something of Peter's self or life transformation. The metamorphosis Simon undergoes is marked further in Jesus' commission. First, he and his partners will no longer sell dead fish in the marketplace, but will catch people alive, giving them liberty. Jesus himself is first portrayed as a kind of fisherman, proclaiming God's word from a boat, catching Simon and his companions alive. And now he promises that Simon and his partners will do the same. Jesus also marks a break in Simon's history with the phrase, from now on. Simon, James, and John add to this conclusion their own response, leaving everything, they followed him. Conversion, then, is realized as a change of vocation, an anticipated participation in Jesus' mission, and is implicated in Luke's more general ethic concerning wealth and faith. They leave their boats, they leave the enormous catch of fish, and they leave everything associated with their livelihood in order to follow Jesus. On the most obvious level, then, 
these newly commissioned disciples experience conversion as a journey with the itinerant Jesus. Come and follow me. At another level, conversion for them entails a new way of life, characterized by a particular comportment with respect to both the material accessories of their former ways of life and with regard to their missionary vocation. At a still further level, though, we find in Luke's unfolding portrait of Peter a journey whereby Peter comes to greater and greater insight into Jesus' significance. How is this so, we might ask? Although Peter evidences keen insight in this scene, keen insight into God's doing is not otherwise characteristic of Peter, at least with not, not without further ado. For example, Peter's lack of faith, lack of understanding, is obvious in Luke's account of Jesus' transfiguration in Luke chapter 9. There, Peter suggests the need for three shrines, one for Moses, one for Elijah, one for Jesus, a suggestion that invites divine disapproval. And in fact, Luke says Peter didn't know what he was talking about. His lack of understanding is obvious in his correct identification of Jesus as God's Christ, his Messiah, coupled with his marked failure to understand the nature of Jesus' Messiahship. Peter's lack of understanding is nowhere more on display, though, than in Luke's twofold references to the disciples' stubbornness, obtuseness, in the face of Jesus' predictions of his passion. Think about it this way. The center part of Luke's gospel, often called the journey story or the journey account, the journey narrative, begins in chapter 9 and ends in chapter 19. At the beginning of the story, we read these words. They didn't understand Jesus. Its meaning was hidden from them, so they couldn't grasp it. They were afraid to ask. At the end of the story, this long account, we read these words. They didn't understand this statement. Its meaning was hidden from them, so they couldn't grasp it, and they were afraid to ask. Ten chapters have gone by, years of seminary education, you might say, and the results are the same. Why are Peter and his companions so slow to comprehend? After all, these ten chapters, Luke 9 to 19, are very much concerned with instruction, where Jesus teaches his disciples over and over again the character of God and the character of God's agenda. Why don't they understand? And the answer, of course, comes both in chapter 9 and in chapter 19 with these words, its sense was hidden from them. At the end of the journey, we read, the meaning of Jesus' words was concealed from them. Now, some have attempted to lessen the scandal of misapprehension by reading these verbs as, quote-unquote, divine passives. It was hidden from them. That is to say, God hid the message from them. God concealed its meaning from them. In other words, some interpreters think that God has prevented the disciples from understanding Jesus' words. This reading actually stands in tension with Luke's portrait of what the disciples ought to know. For example, in chapter 10, in the context of revelatory prayer, Jesus turns to the disciples and says to them privately, blessed are your eyes that see what you see. The disciples are those to whom the secrets of the kingdom have been granted, chapter 8. And Jesus' injunction in chapter 9, take these words to heart, or perhaps more woodenly, let these words sink into your ears. Words like that seem to presume that the disciples should have understood. Nevertheless, Luke's wording in chapter 18 is emphatic. They lacked understanding. The meaning was hidden. They lacked perception. They were too afraid to discuss it with Jesus. Not a high point, you might say. Not a high watermark, you might say, in the relationship between Jesus and his disciples. Their, their, their misapprehension, their failure continues through the entire Gospel of Luke until the very concluding moments of chapter 24 when Luke reports that Jesus, quote, Jesus opened their minds to understand the Scriptures, 2445. 
<clears throat> well, in my view, what was holding Peter and his companions back was not God, was not God keeping them from understanding, but was in fact their lack of the categories of thought, the conceptual patterns adequate to understand Jesus' message. They were following hundreds of years of expectation, hundreds of years of anticipation. They simply couldn't understand what he was trying to tell them. Accordingly, immediately after Jesus' first passion prediction, they argue over who's the greatest. After the second passion prediction, they try to keep a blind man from bothering Jesus. It seems pretty clear that they just don't get it. They can't sort out what Jesus' exalted status might mean in relationship to dishonor and misfortune. They can't integrate Jesus' status as the Christ with his rejection by human beings. We might say that the primary human problem for Luke is ignorance but only if by ignorance we mean something more than lacking knowledge. Knowledge is embodied. Knowledge refers less to facts and figures and more to patterns of thinking, feeling, believing, and behaving. We should thus understand Luke's notion of ignorance less in terms of lacking information and more with regard to faulty conceptual patterns or possessing a faulty imagination an incapacity to understand because they lack the categories to make sense of what Jesus was saying. Ignorance would thus be a failure at the most profound level to grasp adequately God's agenda. Accordingly, as long as Jesus' disciples remained embedded in their former ways of construing God's project, as long as they remain in their former ways of construing the nature of life before God, they are blinded to what God is doing. They simply can't make sense of it. What is needed then is a theological makeover, a deep-seated transformation in their conception of God, and thus a deep-seated transformation in their commitments, their attitudes, and their everyday practices. Consequently, the antidote to ignorance is not simply amassing more and more data but in fact, realignment with God's ancient purpose. Now coming to fruition, in other words, conversion, and they need divine forgiveness. To continue the story of Peter's conversion, we find that the disciples' failure to understand God's purpose finds its resolution in Luke 24 in Acts chapter 2, which formed the pivot point for Luke's narrative as it moves from the Gospel of Luke to the book of Acts. First, the disciples have Jesus himself as their teacher, where he opens the scriptures to them, Luke 24, 32. Second, Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures, Luke 24, 45. Third, they receive the Holy Spirit, who enables inspired interpretation of the scriptures, Acts chapter 2. As a result, they go on to proclaim through their Representative Peter, that in God's economy, the high status of God's anointed one is not contradicted by humiliation and suffering. Instead, in his passion and exaltation, Jesus embodies the status reversal comprising salvation. His death was the focal point of the divine human struggle over how life ought to be lived, whether in humility or in self-elevation. Finally, we might say, Acts chapter 2, finally, Peter must be finally converted. But the story continues. And with it, Peter's insight into God's agenda continues to develop. Let me visit one further celebrated account where we can refer to Peter's ongoing conversion, Acts chapter 9, 32 through 11, 18. In this series of episodes, Peter stands in an ambiguous relationship to long-standing ideas grounded in careful boundary markers between clean and unclean. On the one hand, we find in chapter 10 that he expresses his awareness of and his allegiance to those ancient ideas. He responds to the Lord in his vision, 
Lord, no, I have never eaten anything that is impure or unclean. I've actually always found those words troubling. How do you use these words together? Lord, no. It seems to me calling Jesus Lord implies yes, and yet Peter says, Lord, no. Later, when relating this vision at Jerusalem, Peter's recollection is even more emphatic. He reports that this is what he said. Lord, no, nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth, 11, 8. Moreover, as Peter reads himself to enter Cornelius' house, he voices this ancient socio-religious script. He says, it is forbidden that a Jew associate with or visit a Gentile, 10, 28. And when Peter returns to Jerusalem after his encounter with Cornelius, he is castigated precisely on this point for sharing Gentile hospitality, chapter 11, verses 2 and 3. On the one hand, we also see Peter's commitment to those ideas. On the other hand, there are two lines of evidence that suggest that Peter is on a collision course with the ideas that he himself is espousing. First, chapter 9, verses 32 to 43 show that Peter has not only departed Jerusalem, but has been moving progressively away from the holy city, from Jerusalem to traveling throughout the whole region, 932, to Lydda, to Joppa, and on to Caesarea. This geographical movement is mirrored in his crossing boundaries of another kind as well, as he begins to move among the sick, exposing himself to corpse impurity in order to restore a dead woman to life, and then takes up lodging at the home of a tanner, that is, the home of someone whose livelihood would have implicated him perpetually in ritual impurity. Thus, when we find Peter on a tanner's roof arguing with the Lord over issues of ritual purity, we might begin to wonder about Peter's apparent hypocrisy. It's perhaps unsurprising that when Peter relates his story to the Jerusalem believers, he admits to staying in Joppa, but he drops that not insignificant detail that he had been staying in a tanner's home with dead animal skins around. From his perch on the roof of a tanner's house, the symbolic distance represented by crossing the threshold of the house of a Gentile is hardly more than a baby's step. If concerns with purity are correlated with three matrices of persons and spaces and foods, then all three have been crossed by Peter. Peter has moved outside the land of the Jews. He interacts with Gentiles, and now the Lord directs him to eat animals of all kinds. In this story, acceptance and friendship are extended and embraced across social and religious lines. In the exchange between Peter and Cornelius, a transformation of conceptual patterns occurs in a progression of steps. Peter insists first that he's only a human being. He decides to forego the Jewish ban on sharing hospitality with Gentiles. Cornelius testifies that he's received a message from God. Peter recognizes that Jesus Christ is indeed Lord of all. The Spirit comes upon Cornelius and his household. Those who had received the Spirit are baptized with water and they all share household hospitality over the ensuing days. It's interesting simply to follow the story of Peter as you work through Acts chapter 10. He has a vision after which, this is my picture of him, he's stroking his chin, thinking to himself, Luke says, he wondered what that was about. He then has an encounter with messengers from Cornelius' house. The end result is that he's stroking his chin again. What is that about? He comes to Cornelius' house and says, I came here out of obedience, but tell me, why am I here? And now, Cornelius, who is neither a Jew nor a Christian, but a God-fearer, God-fearing Gentile, tells Peter that before Peter got there, God had already shown up and spoken to Cornelius and given him instructions, and he says, now you are here and God is here and we are ready to listen. And that's when Peter is able to say these words, the first time these words show up in Luke Acts. 
these words, ah, ah, oh, now I understand. Jesus is Lord of all. This is Peter's conversion, as well as Cornelius' conversion, which leads finally into the conversion of the Jerusalem community as they come face to face with what God has done. Let me put it to you this way. Peter has not gone where God has not gone before. There are people who struggle with whether the Wesley Armenian notion of prevenient grace can be found in Scripture. Here is a wonderful example. God goes before. God lays the ground. God gets there first. Peter gets to participate in what God is already doing with Peter. I'm sorry, with Cornelius and his household. Well, whatever else Luke has recounted here, he has represented at least this, the ongoing conversion of Peter, who experiences a profound makeover in terms of his theological and moral patterns of thinking, feeling, believing, and behaving. Peter, and with him the Jerusalem community, progress toward an ever more full embodiment of transformed patterns of thinking expressed in the confession that Jesus is, after all, indeed, Lord of all. Now, I focus primarily on Peter's conversionary journey, but it needs to be understood that his journey is a shared one. He is one of the 12, and even when the spotlight shines most brightly on him alone, it often signals him out as a representative of the others. Importantly, throughout the entire process, we've only partially summarized, Peter never ceases to be a Jew. Conversion for him is not the movement from one religion to another. It is rather a journey by which he is more and more deeply embedded in a particular way of construing or tracing God's agenda with Israel. He undergoes a metamorphosis realized in the transformation of new patterns and reflection and practices. The fisherman now fishes for people to catch them alive and bring them liberty. The owner of a small business now depends on others' hospitality as he participates in announcing the good news. Conversion is a journey, more and more light given to Peter as if the journey takes one in the direction of the dawning of God's restorative aims. Finally then, let me identify some key elements that arise from this conversion theme as Luke tells the story. Firstly, conversion is a gift. This is true at multiple levels. In step with God's promises, God sets in motion the series of events that leads to John's ministry, Jesus' mission, and Peter's call and commission. The risen Lord opens Peter's mind to grasp the meaning of Scripture. The Spirit endows Peter with the capacity to interpret for others God's purpose in the Scriptures. God's own voice opens the way for Peter to see what it means to affirm that Jesus is Lord of all. Conversion comes from divine initiative. Conversion is a gift. Second, conversion must be understood in terms of the journey, a process. This is in some ways no surprise at all for readers of Luke Acts, who understand that Jesus' most characteristic activity in the Gospel of Luke is walking around, journeying. Or people who've read the book of Acts and know that one of Luke's favorite terms for the church is the way. One of Luke's favorite terms for the gospel is the way, the way of salvation. Conversion then must be understood, especially in terms of a process, a journey. In Peter's case, the journey includes in a walk around ambulatory discipleship, transversing Galilee up to Jerusalem, all as a traveling companion of the itinerant Jesus. But this portrait of Peter as a walkabout disciple symbolizes something more. It's not simply that Peter converts from one form of fishing to another. 
This way of putting things fails to account for the ongoing transformation that this disciple and witness to Jesus' resurrection experiences. It too easily suggests that Peter moves from one place to another as though life were lived in one container or another, when in fact, conversion for Luke is movement along the path. Conversion for Luke seems to be more about direction than destination. In a sense, with conversion, the journey is the destination. As Augustine, or Augustine, puts it in another context, our homeland has also made itself the true road to our homeland. Accordingly, it makes sense, third, that this conversionary journey is a transformative process, a renewal of the patterns of thinking, feeling, believing, and behaving according to which we experience and make sense of God and God's project in the world. Fourth, conversion is inseparably tied to practices. That is, Peter engages in certain behaviors that are themselves conversionary. He follows the voice of Jesus. He departs from his material livelihood. He engages in economic sharing and prayer. He crosses boundaries toward the sick and marginal. He bears witness to Jesus. And these behaviors are themselves conversionary of Peter. Now, stay with me on this. Note carefully. These behaviors are not simply the result of conversion, as though such practices simply put conversion on display for all to see. Behavior is not an add-on to conversion. Instead, conversionary practices are themselves constitutive of conversion. That's because conversion refers to transformed patterns of human life. Practices serve not only as the window into which one sees one's deepest commitments, but also as the embodiment of those commitments. With these emphases divine initiative, conversionary journey, a process of transformation, and conversionary practices as constitutive of conversion. With these emphases, we have ourselves traveled a country mile away from the definition of conversion provided by William James. Remember William James with his focus on instantaneous instances, grisly blood palsying sensation, tremendous emotional excitement. Whatever else it is, conversion is the story of God's prevenient, his grace, leading to an ever more communal and ever more deep embodiment of God's agenda in the lives of Christ followers. Well, thank you for your attention this evening. And let me see what questions you want to raise with me. Thank you. That, that's inspiring and terrific. I really appreciate Thank you very that. much. Yeah. And um, reinforces some things I guess I've been thinking and exploring. So thank you for that. One of the... So I'm trying to think some of the implications of this. I may be completely off in this, but it seems to me that, uh, and I don't know New Testament studies or biblical studies, we, you know, those are the caveats. But don't we have something like this around the Reformation, uh, uh, a belief in the sort of per perspicuity of Scripture hmm? over against the reading of Scripture by those who really know what it means? and write a privileged class for interpreting it. Yep. And it seems to me that this account of conversion heads in the direction of saying, you're invited to listen to the reading of Scripture, but don't think that you know what it means until you have traveled this journey, right? Until the Spirit has worked in you, transforming you, you shouldn't think that you're going to get there faster than Peter, and, and so on. And so when we get even within the church, here's sort of the ethics guy, we get certain controversies and contests right now going on, some of them pretty deep, that if we're reading Scripture this way, should we say, well, really what we need to do 
is to defer to those who have been more fully converted, not think that this is some matter of uh, democratic process or think that scripture is equally open to whoever might read it or whoever is Christian. I, I don't know if this is making sense. but well, It makes it, perfect it, it, sense, and I appreciate so much uh, your questions. Uh, questions is what I heard there. Uh, I think that actually one of the difficulties we have is the notion of per the perspicuity of Scripture uh, as if anyone could understand it. And let me, let me clarify what I mean by this. I remember back when I was in seminary, I was in charge of editing a journal, uh, a very small journal, and I wrote F.F. F. Bruce, who you may know as the, the dean of evangelical biblical studies in the world in the 19, latter part of the 19th, uh, 20th century. And I asked him to, uh, to reflect on the question, can anyone understand the Bible? And part of what I was trying to get him to reflect on was the problem that sometimes we have in churches where people leave seminary and they have, you know, the Hebrew Bible here and uh, BDB along with it and uh, the, the Greek lexicon and the New Testament. And they are now the experts. And so I asked him to think about this. And, and this is what he said. Can anyone understand the Bible? His first response was yes. The next uh, thing he wrote was a comma. And the next word he wrote was but. <laughs> it was a great essay. Because what he pressed on was not the need for experts, but the, the need for a church, for a community of God's people who had devoted themselves to the lordship of Jesus Christ. That that was more important to uh, what F.A. Bruce wanted to press than all of the techniques uh, that we might uh, want to say or talk about. And then let me say, um, uh, I wrote a book. Uh, I've edited a book on method. So I'm not anti-method, but I'm trying to say that, that a good bit of what we're talking about here is the, the process of learning through the ongoing conversion of God's people into greater and greater Christ-likeness, into more and more of God's image so that we understand better what it is that God wants to do. One of my favorite stories in this respect is Luke chapter 4, uh, beginning with verse 1. Jesus has just been baptized. The Spirit comes upon him. He's out in the wilderness. He and the devil have a little Bible study match. Uh, the devil uh, asks him some questions. Um, you could translate it this way. Since you're God's son, then what about this? What about turning this stone into bread? Uh, so the devil's not trying to call into question whether Jesus is God's son. He's just trying to tell him what it means to be God's son. Jesus, of course, writes himself into Deuteronomy chapter 6 and Deuteronomy chapter 8 as he responds to the devil. The devil finally catches on and quotes the Bible back to Jesus. And Jesus, again, quotes scripture a third time. One of the puzzles that I try to put in front of my students is this. Why do you trust Jesus reading in the Bible, but not the devil's? And the answer, of course, is, well, you know, the devil's kind of an unsavory character not the kind of person you want to trust. But it sort of raises the question nonetheless, what is it about Jesus reading uh, that's great and, and the devil's isn't? And it seems to me one of the answers has to be uh, Jesus' grasp of God's agenda by which he understands how to read the Bible. And of course, I also try to explain to my students, uh, if Jesus gets himself killed in part because of the way he reads the Bible, then God raising him from the dead is God saying, yeah, uh, he read it right. Uh, Jesus is vindicated uh, by God saying, yes, he's, he's the interpreter that we trust. Well, all of this is to say that if, if I could wave a magic wand of some kind, ring a bell, and it would all be happening, it would be churches that would spend uh, more time than we do today engaging in reading Scripture together with the kind of humility that you've just talked about. Um, and in fact, I almost wanted to stop you at one place. You never get to say, this is what the Bible means, I want to say. Every reading of Scripture is in some ways provisional, uh, open to more light, to more enlightenment. I wish that uh, churches spent more, not less time, engaging in Scripture with the kind of humility that you've just spoken about, uh, the journey of continuing along the process. One of my former PhD students, I have no idea if this is true, but this is what he said, and I like it, whether it's true or not. He says, he's a Roman Catholic. He says, you know, it takes us 75 years 
to really change something in our church. Well, that's a long time. 75 years. And the more I thought about that, the more I thought that was about right. Because the people who actually make the change are not the ones who were pressing for the change in the beginning. There has to be a long obedience in the same direction, as, as Eugene Peterson put it. There has to be a long process, a long journey together to sort out what God's agenda is uh, before the church moves too quickly or the other. Did I say something wrong? Oh, okay, very good. So thanks for that question. It's a wonderful question. One of the puzzles uh, for Luke, this is not so much in the Gospel of Mark, one of the puzzles for the Gospel of Luke is, is that we go continually to the Old Testament, to Israel scriptures, to understand God's agenda. But the only way to understand the scriptures is to understand God's agenda, according to which we read the scriptures. But the only way to have access to God's agenda is the scriptures. But the only way, are you with me so far? The, the circularity at work here? It's a really interesting process because it suggests the very thing that you said. One, uh, the community of God's people. Two, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Three, the example of Jesus as he reads the Bible. One of the practices, if you wanted to lay them out, the conversionary practices that you find in the book of Acts is, in fact, engagement with Scripture. Uh, scripture telling people what God's agenda is and, therefore, what they need to do if they're going to catch up with what God is doing in the world. Well, you got a lot more than you asked for there, but it's an important topic for me. Someone else, I'll promise to be shorter, maybe. Yeah, thank you. Uh, sometimes I worry there are very few Corneliuses anymore. And here's what I mean by that. Um, have you heard the, phrase, the word pre-evangelism? Have you heard that word? Uh, I worry that churches do less and less uh, to let people take small steps in the direction of, of uh, experiencing being open to God's grace. The synagogue was that for the church in the first century. Cornelius is a God-fearing Gentile. He gives alms, he prays. And the, uh, the, the incredible thing uh, at the beginning of Acts chapter 10 is when the visitation comes, the angel comes, he says, God has heard your prayer. And you wonder, well, wait a minute, he's, he's not in the right group. He's neither Jew nor a Christian. How is God listening to his prayer? But there were for the synagogue, there were for the church synagogues that, that, that had a, what I sometimes think of as a large front porch uh, where people can encounter, uh, be a part of what God is doing in the world. Who are the people today? Uh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, sometimes I think about people in, um, uh, uh, when I was especially involved with people who lived on the street uh, back in Northern California, I often found surprising uh, nodes of discipleship on the street, places where the church would never go, and yet somehow God got there anyway. And they would do weird things like have groups of 12 and not even know why they were doing it. Uh, they would pray together. They would uh, celebrate uh, uh, Sunday together. Uh, sometimes I look at uh, uh, people that I'm uh, close with where I am in Southern California, and I think that AA is a place where I see God's grace at work in surprising ways. Uh, there is in the AA tradition some of William James. Uh, you, you might hear some of the language I was using with William James in step one of the 12 steps. And I, I look at what they're doing and sometimes think that that's a way in which uh, people are opening themselves to a God that they can't name, perhaps. Uh, they may even be afraid to name that God. They may have, have left the church because of the names that were given God in their church. But I look at the, um, uh, the dedication, the seriousness, the meditation, the uh, community practices. Uh, one, of, one of my closest uh, family members uh, has been in AA 10 years, and she moved to Los Angeles last year 
her Facebook exploded. You know Facebook, right? Even in Canada, yeah, where you can get the internet maybe. <laughs> her Facebook exploded, and it happens every time she moves. And it's not the people in her church that blow up her Facebook uh, with all of the friend requests. It's the meeting she goes to, the AA meeting. It's an amazing thing to watch uh, these folks be what you hope the church will be. Uh, and I wonder then to some degree whether God's grace hasn't gotten to places where we hadn't anticipated it. Uh, I, I have appreciated a lot living in places like Aberdeen, Scotland, uh, Northern California, uh, to some degree Southern California, where 3 or 4% of the population go to church on Sunday. I grew up in uh, what some people call the belt of the, the buckle of the Bible belt. That's the phrase. Uh, and, and taught for a number of years in Kentucky where uh, the number one house builder in Lexington, Kentucky put scripture verses on the outside of the bricks of the, of the houses he built. Where everybody's a Christian, is anybody a Christian? You see what I'm trying to say? Of course there are Christians there, but, but there's a kind of um, acceptance and uh, status that comes along with being a Christian in contexts like that. Whereas nobody, when they run for office in Berkeley, California, will say, I teach Sunday school at such and such church. It's a good way not to get elected. And so the, the quality of, of faith and the, the quality of, of discernment around uh, where God's grace is at work, that becomes much more important in a context like that. And um, I hope for places like that. But I have to tell you, I also struggle with the degree to which churches have doors, but not uh, front porches. Uh, you're either in or you're out. You're not sitting rocking on a chair on the outside. I promised a shorter answer, but I'm not sure I delivered. You're asking great questions. Those are wonderful questions. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, and let me say, I've never actually pictured Peter stroking his beard. But I can see why you would. <laughs> if I could grow a beard, then I might, I might think of such things. I, I think you're absolutely right. There are two things that happen in Luke 1, 2, and 3 that push in this direction. First of all, when um, John the Baptist's parents come on the scene in Luke chapter 1, verses 5 and following, their story uh, model, is modeled after the story of Abraham and Sarah, which is to say that if you want to understand the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, you don't start in Luke 1. You start in Genesis with the story of Abraham and Sarah. What, what I often have to remind my students is that Abraham was not the father of the Jews. He was the father of many nations. And the other thing that's interesting about Luke uh, chapter 3 when you read that most exciting uh, part of Luke 3, Luke 3, 23 to 38, the genealogy of Jesus, on which I've never heard a sermon, uh, it goes all the way back to Adam, which is to say it's grounded very much in the, 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 the totality of what God is doing in creation. So sometimes I think of, of salvation in Luke Acts as uh, God's uh, grace, God's salvation, God's working out his restoration – 
in all of its fullness to all. Uh, and so in that sense, uh, election sometimes means these but not those. But in the way that uh, Luke tells the story, it seems to me it's not these versus those. It's, if you will, whosoever will. It's open to everyone uh, as you read from Luke 1 all the way to Acts 28. So I, I think that makes perfect sense. Thanks for raising it that way. Oh. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Very helpful and, and nice to be here amongst a lot of you that I already know. Um, I guess I'm thinking along the lines of uh, where you say the church doesn't have a front porch uh, for, for the process of conversion, which you've beautifully highlighted. Uh, I wonder where the place of elders in the church uh, play a role as showing the, the, the process and allowing those younger uh, members to grow into conversion and the role of disorientation within conversion. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Especially when we talk about the uh, thing back to Bill Wilson and the first step, that that's, that's not conversion itself, but it's the beginning of conversion, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, the place of elders in allowing deconversion before you get to the, the next Yeah, I, I think that's a really wonderful question, and I wish that uh, we could reflect on that together a lot longer than just the couple of minutes we have right here. Um, I think that the the degree to which William James's notion of conversion has infected uh, the church in the West is the degree to which we can't even address that question. Let me give you an illustration. Uh, back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, uh, which was just yesterday, it seems like, I was uh, involved in a Bible study in Richmond, California, which is up in the Bay Area. And we we're just reading Luke. We just start reading Luke. We get a few... Um, a paragraphs down the road and we pick it up next Friday night and we keep reading. We get to this place in Luke chapter 12 where Jesus says, if you don't give up everything, then you can't be my disciple. And this person sitting right next to me, his name is Scott, he says, oh my gosh, I'm not sure I'm a disciple. I thought that was one of the most exciting moments I've ever been in a Bible study where there's this, this, it's like the hand comes out of the page and grabs you and tries to pull you in. And you begin to struggle with really important questions. Uh, but we didn't get to go there because the pastor, I wasn't the pastor, the pastor said, of course you're a disciple, Scott. And it was all over. So in that sense, you see what I'm saying? It's either in or you're out. You're in, so there's no more need to keep going. Uh, if you're out, then we can take care of that. But if we actually looked at reading Scripture, praying, engaging with people who are outside the church, if we looked at these practices as genuine practices that were conversionary and not simply the consequence of conversion, they were the conversionary, then we would, wouldn't we? We would put in place in our churches the possibilities for growth. One of the struggles that I have as a dean with uh, some of my faculty is trying to get them to think through whether somebody can learn something without being told. My faculty tend to think they have to say it or it won't be heard, won't be learned. And I try to get them to understand that saying it doesn't mean it's learned. What's the arena within which you can put students so that when they discover something and learn something, it goes all the way down? That's the question I'm asking. And I, I would love to see uh, churches engage in that kind of question themselves. Not in some kind of, you know, artificial, manipulative way. If we just do this kind of uh, thing, then we'll get these kinds of results. Because the truth is, you never know what the results are. You never know what God's Spirit's going to do. You never know where grace is going to take people. But that's part of the journey and the danger of the journey. Things could happen you hadn't actually planned for. I hope you come up with five good answers to your question. It would be lovely to see them. Anyone else? Well, thank you so much for this evening and for that matter, the last uh, two days, which have been just delightful. Uh, as long as I've been inside, it's been delightful to be here with you and to share something of the journey with you all. Thank you. Thank you. And just in conclusion.
I want to thank uh, Joel for being here, for accepting the invitation two years ago uh, to come and for having spread before us a feast over the last two days. Uh, and with the change in wardrobe that you noticed uh, when you landed in Minneapolis a couple of days ago, it must have seemed something like this sheet full of strange animals descending from, from heaven. But uh, Lord, no. <laughs> Lord, no, that that was your answer when you came out of the airport on, on uh, Saturday night. Lord, no, not this. But we've enjoyed having you, Joel, and it's been delightful to have you and to really enjoy this feast together. So thank you so much for your time.